one thing I've learned with the, with the communities here is that people should work. So when we teach them to work, that's when they'll own the work and they'll be able to continue with their livelihood. When you give free things, like if you found a woman and a man like this one talking, yeah? And then you give them something, they'll say, oh, that white man and seeing that we are so poor, that's why he's giving us. They'll not own that money, they'll misuse that money. They'll, they'll think like they want to sit and expect someone to come and give them things for free. And it lowers the dignity of the people because they are able to work. But when you give them free things, it's like you are lowering their dignity and increasing the poverty level. start with relief and rehabilitation and development. So we've got a picture here. and You can imagine that this is a, a picture of our person. And this could be a person anywhere in the world, quite frankly. That person is at a particular level of poverty or of poverty alleviation. They're, they're at some level that's kind of their baseline. But then the earthquake hits. A crisis happens. And that person is being plunged downwards into poverty. Relief is the appropriate intervention. Relief is an attempt to stop the bleeding. But once the bleeding has stopped, you then enter into what's called the rehabilitation phase, trying to restore that person in Haiti to where they were before the earthquake hit. And then finally, development is this last phase. It's walking with that person across time in ways that help them to move beyond where they were before. So relief and rehabilitation and development. Now, as I, as I have that diagram up there, I have one concern, and that's this. It is not the case that most poor people that you are working with are coming out of a crisis. It's not the case that every single poor person is going to go through these phases of relief and rehabilitation development. Most people that you're going to work with, uh, either at home and abroad, are actually not coming out of a crisis, they don't need relief or rehabilitation, they're simply at some level and they need you to walk with them across time in ways that we would call developmental. And So that's actually the situation that most people are in with whom you'll be working. The issue of relief, rehabilitation and development is really answering the question of causality. What's caused the person the household, the community, to be in the situation that they're in. Not all poverty is created equal, meaning our approach to helping must first be evaluated. For instance, in the case of global hunger, over one billion people worldwide suffer from this chronic state of living. Yet, in a 1980 study presented by The Hunger Project, only 10% of those facing the issue require relief as a response. Helping a family or community facing the hunger crisis may not only avoid the heart of the problem, but may actually inhibit any future development. One of the key issues in well-meaning people who want to help poor people is they often can end up creating a system of paternalism or act very paternalistically. Paternalism is habitually doing for people and providing for people things that they can do and provide for themselves. Let me come in and kind of do this for you. So our church comes here and we're going to do VBS over there the way it should be done. Or we're going to come build this the way it should be built. And that's detrimental. I think we're missing the understanding that it is a long process. We really like solutions that are prepackaged and relatively simple that have worked somewhere and that we can just plug in. And so the idea that I need to be committed to something for a long time and that it's going to be difficult and that I might get kicked in the stomach and I have to be committed to get back up and keep trying um, is what I, I think takes the wind out of the sails for some people. That's why it's easier to do short, quick bursts of, of good deeds. You know, that it's a lot harder to get people to sign on the dotted line for. We see a problem when we treat symptoms, right? 
and symptoms counteract other symptoms and this drug reacts with this drug and we constantly are chasing systems and managing symptoms rather than getting to the core issue of the human condition which is mine as well as yours. The mission of the church is to preach a holistic gospel. It's just that we come from a background where social and spiritual and had been separated. So we are going back to preaching a holistic gospel that will deal with the whole person. Part of my background has poverty within it. Personally, I grew up in this type of a life. I've slept hungry at some stage, I've lacked school fees at some stage, and therefore when I come to a context like this, when they talk, I can't connect. So that's what really pushed me into this type of engagement. And uh, as an economics student, I felt being moved towards development, and therefore, I started engaging with communities even before I got out here because of that passion and that thinking that, hey, life can be better than what we are seeing. As a believer, I kept on wondering at some stage, why is it that some have the resources, some don't? And all of them are created by the same God. There's a lot of self-esteem which goes back to your connectedness to your creator. So for most of these guys, the first stage we take them through, even in business, is not uh, directly into business training. It's helping them to deal with their hearts and transform that from within. And uh, later on, we, thought we discovered actually trying to work with the people and going directly into businesses, that it's not working. Give money to people to start businesses. You come a month later, there's nothing. What they did is just increase their consumption. Then you realize that there was more deeper problem into the heart other than in the hands. So transformation starts in the head, but it has to sink deeply into the heart, and hopefully that heart is transformed into the hands. So that's what really we, we work towards. Now, the key dynamic in development work is promoting an empowering process. The process is what matters. Now, this process will typically occur in or result in some products or projects. It might be a well that's being dug. It, it, it might be a house that's being built. But the process that is being used is at least as important as the product or project itself. Development is as much about how you do the work as it is about what the work itself is. I'm going to give you kind of a crazy example to illustrate my point. And I recognize it's kind of a weird example, but I'm trying to get some ideas across. I want us to imagine two short-term mission trips. The first short-term mission trip focuses on producing a product, period. And what this short-term team does is it, it, it runs into a, a poor country and it builds three houses and it gives three houses away to the local people and the short-termers get back on the airplane and they fly home. And they stand up in church and they say, we went and we built three houses. The focus is on the production of houses. Now think of a different kind of short-term trip that focuses on the process and tries to create an empowering process because the goal isn't just to have the house built. The goal is restoration of relationships with God, self, others, and the rest of creation. The goal is to help people who are suffering from a marred identity for a whole bunch of historical reasons the goal is to help people who often have a profound sense of shame to understand that they're made in the image of God, to have inherent dignity and worth and capacity. And they're called to be stewards over creation. They're called to try to develop the creation and unfold the creation as God intended. That's the goal. 
So what this short-term missions team does is they first only go if they're asked to go by the people there. Imagine that one. Now, once they get there, they say to the people, what would you like to do? Now, if the people are honest, they're going to say, let's hang out together all week. But they probably aren't going to be able to be honest with you. So we'll get to that later. So they'll, they'll say, well, let, let's build three houses. And what this short-term missions team says, keeping the end in mind of reconciliation, this short-term team says, how do you think we should do it? And the people say, let's try building our houses out of toothpicks. I told you, it's kind of a crazy example. Now, this short-term team, the goal for them isn't just the building of houses. It's a process that will result in empowerment. And so this short-term team is a little hesitant to say, toothpicks seem like a stupid idea. So what they might actually do that week is join hands with the local people, working side by side, building houses out of toothpicks. Now, at the end of the week, a big wind comes through and it wipes out all three houses. You now have toothpick rubble everywhere. And this short-term mission team gets back on the airplane. There's, toothpick, there's mounds of toothpick rubble everywhere. Failed trip, right? But the short-term team notices the village leaders standing around the toothpick rubble and going, man, that didn't work right. Let's try something different. Let's try using bricks next time, which is a more successful missions trip. If you focus just on delivering a material resource, a house, the first one is. But if you're focused on creating an empowering process that helps people to be restored to people who are stewarding their communities who are trying to figure it out, this is a more successful trip. Now, if you're wondering, would he really not tell them that toothpicks were a bad idea? I'd tell him. I'd tell him. But the point I'm trying to get at is the deeper point. Focus on the process.